Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and this episode is sponsored by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Also, you can use our code GENERATIONTECH, one word, on their website if you want to save 10% on your next purchase. You can probably also create a website specifically dedicated to breaking down the Galactic Republic's entire budget and discretionary spending. Which is exactly what I'm going to be talking about today, and I promise you it's not as boring as it sounds. Maybe it's a little boring. So just how exactly did the Republic pay for the entire clone army? This is pretty important. Now we talk a lot about the beginnings of the clone army on this channel, so we're gonna give you a very brief and quick intro. Decades before the beginning of the Clone Wars, Darth Plagueis, as his alter ego, Higo Damas, put into motion the creation of a gigantic army for the Republic, as a part of his overall plan to rid the galaxy of the Jedi. But before he even came up with this idea, Plagueis realized he needed to amass a large amount of political and financial capital. He did this first by gaining the trust of the board of the Intergalactic Banking Clan, and eventually groomed the Mune by the name of San Hill to become the next chairman of the IGBC. Higo Damas was also the chairman of Damas Holdings, a very powerful financial group that lobbied on behalf of different causes across the entire galaxy. Without control of these gigantic banking assets, it would have been impossible for Plagueis and Sidious to fund the Republic's war against the Separatists. Just the additional R&D and cost of the first batch of 200,000 clones and their 10 years of training, along with housing, equipment, and weapons, would cost a small fortune that very few planets outside the core worlds could actually afford. Now, contrary to popular belief, Master Sifo Diaz was not really responsible for the creation of the clone army. Higo Damas had simply learned that Jedi Master Sifo Diaz was concerned that the Republic would not be able to prevent the outbreak of a civil war. And he used his knowledge to convince Sifo Diaz to go ahead and contact the Kaminoans and create the clone army. In the novel Darth Plagueis, the Moon has the following conversation with Sifo Diaz. Who in the right mind would fund an army that might never be used? I would. The Kaminoans will not create an army for me, but they would do so for the Jedi Order. They have been fascinated by the Jedi for millennia. The Kaminoans need only a modest down payment, which I could provide to you through untraceable accounts I maintain in Outer Rim Banks. The modest down payment most likely paid for some expansions to the Kaminoan cloning facilities. The cloners there had specialized in smaller and more high-end projects. They were considered the best cloners in the galaxy, and their high premium had limited the scope of their operation. Still, the Kaminoans were quite cunning business people and rather risk-adverse. But as Plagueis said, they were extremely interested in the Jedi Order, specifically the Jedi's DNA and what genetic factors increase midichlorian counts in beings. Also, the Jedi were an extremely old and stable institution backed by none other than the Republic. A business with them, even at this size, would be a relatively low risk and high reward operation. Now, one of the most important legislations that were passed by the Galactic Senate was the Emergency Powers Act. This was an amendment to the Galactic Constitution in 24 BBY proposed by none other than Darth Binks, a Gungan evil mastermind. Jar Jar is a key to all this. The Emergency Powers Act actually did three crazy things. First, it eliminated term limits for the Supreme Chancellor and gave the executive branch control over when to hold elections. Second, it allowed the Chancellor to act without Senate approval. And third, it gave only the Chancellor the ability to declare when the emergency that gave him power was over. Forget Order 66, Chancellor Palpatine basically became Emperor right then. The only thing he really had to worry about was justifying his actions as fighting the Separatist threat, and most likely the Senate wouldn't move against him. It does make sense why the Senate would do this, because the Separatist crisis was actually very terrifying. Imagine if one day Canada all of a sudden stopped wanting to be a part of America, and then started attacking the northern states, and the United States for some reason didn't have a federal military. No matter what your political affiliations are, you'd probably give Chancellor Trump the ability to create an army of MAGA droids to wipe out the Canadian threat. With unlimited power, Palpatine was able to quickly pass the Military Creation Act, which had been stuck in limbo in the Senate. The Republic had been demilitarized for almost a thousand years. The incredibly bloody Seventh Battle of Rusan had led to the Rusan Reformation, which removed the Jedi from a military role and also disbanded the federal military, shifting those assets and powers to regional defense forces. Now, the bill initially encountered a lot of resistance because it was essentially pushing local defense forces and militias into a federal military force. It's one thing to fight for your home planet, it's another thing to be sent to another planet you've never seen and try to defend that planet. 
With the discovery of the clone army, things changed pretty rapidly, but the Senate still had to figure out a way to reallocate resources to fund this massive military. One obvious way to do this was by defunding local defense forces. This was also a strategically unwise move because it would leave many systems undefended, while the fledgling GAR scrambled around the galaxy trying to put out numerous fires set by the Separatist droid army. The second way the Senate could do this would be by issuing bonds or maybe defunding other programs that are not considered essential for the war effort. Two years into the war, however, the patched together budget for the JR was on the verge of collapsing the entire Republic. The war had been more costly than expected. Not only did the Senate have to pay for the clones, they also had to pay for the construction of vehicles, weapons, and starships. Many member states had seceded or become active battlegrounds, which really cut into the tax revenue for the Republic. The Outer Rim worlds also had been a source of cheap raw materials and manufacturing. With most of these worlds now under separatist control, the cost for running a war increased dramatically for the Republic. This led to the creation of the Republic Financial Reform Bill, which essentially allowed the Galactic Republic to borrow more money from the intergalactic banking clans and other financial institutions to fund the war. The Republic didn't have a Federal Reserve at the time and couldn't really print money or control the flow of currency in the way they wanted to. The bill would also deregulate the banking industry and allow these financial industries more control over interest rates. This was actually a terrible idea because although the IGBC and most of the banking organizations were neutral, they were also clearly controlling several separatist interests. I mean, just look at those magna droids employed by separatist leader General Grievous. They clearly are a model manufactured solely by the IGBC. This bill would lead to the Republic ordering 5 million new clones and supporting equipment, which would give the GAR the ability to turn the tide against the separatists and launch the Outer Rim Siege. This also would allow the IGBC to raise interest rates for all future loans to the Republic to a ridiculous rate of 25%. After the Battle of Mulanus, the IGBC had to remove its headquarters to the planet of Scipio. Senator Rush Clovis and Padme Amidala find out that the IGBC was actually on the verge of bankruptcy due to mismanagement and corruption. Senator Rush Clovis was initially assigned as temporary head of the IGBC, but eventually he is killed by the Separatists and the control of the banks is seized by Palpatine. This, of course, was all a part of Darth Sidious' plan. With control of the largest banking clans in the galaxy, he could now control and create more currency whenever necessary. This would also give him the Federal Reserve Bank he needed to continue to fund his war and eventually his empire. So that's basically how the Republic was able to afford the clone army. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is the go-to place for creating your own personal iOS websites or online store. Better yet, you don't need any experience in website building or design because they have an assortment of beautiful and modern templates for you to choose from that are easy to modify for your needs. And just in case, they have award-winning 24-7 customer service via live chat and email. Once you're done with your website, Squarespace also has a plethora of marketing tools to optimize traffic. But don't just listen to me talking about Squarespace. Visit their website, which we'll link in the comment section down below, and start a free trial. Also, if you do end up purchasing anything, don't forget to use the 10% discount code Generation Tech. One word and written like you're screaming it at someone. I really enjoyed doing today's video because it kind of shows us what's going on beneath the hood of the Galactic Republic, and it makes it seem a lot more realistic. There are also a lot of correlations we can draw between the Republic and our own governing system, especially when it comes to financial engineering and generating more cash for different government uh, programs. So I hope you learned something today. Also, don't forget to subscribe, uh, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.